Trevor Belmont, one of the most popular characters in the Castlevania series, and likely top three if not top five most popular Belmonts in the clan's history. Hence making him the main protagonist of the animated show was definitely the right move. A lot of viewers loved his portrayal in the show, myself included due to his relationship with Cypher and Alucard. It's not only his contribution to the main trio of the series that captured the hearts of many, but low key is the way he fit in so well with the dark, gritty gray atmosphere of the overall plot. But of course, Trevor is one of the main characters frequently asked in my comments by subscribers and viewers to generate an analysis. Being that he is the main character in the series, I'm pretty sure it was going to happen regardless. So without further delay, it's time to dive deep into the last son of the Belmont clan. Let's get it. Yo, yo. Trevor, like all Belmonts before and after him, are solely dedicated to protecting mankind from supernatural threats and creatures of the night. But their specialty lies in hunting vampire kind. Oh, mm, I'm impressed. Also, like all Belmonts in the series, his experience is unique compared to his predecessors and descendants in the clan. Especially since he is the first Belmont and human to defeat Dracula canonically in the series. Achieving this legendary feat in his first debut of the games, Castlevania III Dracula's Curse. Trevor is revered for his skills not only because he was trained well to be a hunter, but it was due to his atmosphere and experience living as a member of the Belmont clan during his generation. Almost every aspect of Trevor and his story has been adapted into the Netflix series, but of course, there are twists and revisions that Warren Ellis implemented to better suit the story he wanted to tell throughout the seasons. So before we get to analyze the character in the show, I'd like to point out some key differences between the Trevor in the games and in the animated series. First, let's start with the similarities that were adapted into the show. The main similarity is being a descendant of Leon Belmont, evidence in the games and in season 2 when returning to the Belmont Hold. Second is being present during 15th century Europe and being ostracized from human society for being a Belmont. Next is being in the possession of the vampire killer and being a jack of all trades when it comes to using melee weapons. Finally, allying with Sypha and Alucard to inevitably achieve the goal of killing Dracula. Now here are the minor differences. In the show, Trevor is depicted as the last Belmont, but that is not the case in the games. His clan is still alive and thriving, but just operate outside of everyday society. Next is his personality. While both exemplify bravery and honoring their family name, Trevor in the games is a bit of a chivalrous, proud warrior, while in the animated series, he seems to be more of a pessimistic drunk. Next in the show, the Belmont clan was exiled by the church, leading to be hunted down, but in the games, the church cooperates with the Belmont clan in times of crisis. Next, unlike the show, Trevor has never been in possession of the Morning Star. Last, but not least, Trevor was able to take on and defeat Dracula on his own compared to the show where he delivered the final blow to end Dracula after Alucard did most of the work. There are likely more similarities and differences, but these are some points that I found to be more essential to the character and more relatable to the topic of this video. Trevor is an interesting individual, not just because of his popularity in Castlevania, but because of the amount of iterations there are of him in the series all in all. From Castlevania 3 to Curse of Darkness, Castlevania Judgment, and even the Lords of Shadow series, his legend continues. Nonetheless, we're here to talk about his iteration in the Netflix animated show that captured the hearts beyond the gaming series. The same Trevor Belmont we were introduced to at the end of episode 1 of the show drinking his face off as he listens to a couple of drunks referring to a ghost cheese getting clapped. But what am I supposed to do when I find my goat laying on his side in the field, fucked within an inch of its life, and a naked man with blood and straw all over his peck? What the fuck? Delete that footage. Then the tone shifts when a scared townsman comes barging in with bad news of Greshit. And somehow, the blame gets put on his family. In order to not make a stir of them, Trevor like a genius decides to walk up to the bar where the drunks are to ask for another drink, but in the process of paying the bartender, reveals his family crust. He tries at every turn to deny being a Belmont to avoid fighting the drunks, 
but they persist and try to jump him. He easily dispatches them and leaves the bar to throw up and have a good night's sleep in the woods. Along his wayward journey, he makes it to Greshit, and all signs point to nothing good of this city, as a bunch of night creatures are making their way out with a human baby. The main gate is sealed, the water is toxic, waste and decay is everywhere and people are in despair. While interrogating the locals, he learns of the night creatures' daily attacks, of the speakers, and a folk tale about a sleeping soldier. After learning all he could from the city square, he comes upon a clergyman threatening an old man. His impulses react and saves him from being murdered and accompanies him back to his people. Knowing that the old man is his speaker, he urges the group to leave the city before it turns on them, but again they bring up this sleeping soldier, who a missing member of the shoot went to find and just so happens to be the old speaker's grandchild. As Trevor combs through the catacombs to find the missing speaker, he comes upon the cyclops and his petrified victims. Once defeating the Cyclops, the sole survivor is restored, and here he meets Sypha and returns her to the troop as promised. After the deed is done, the men of the church ambush him and bring him to the bishop, and this is where we truly understand Trevor's plight. For you see, Season 1 is mainly a revisionist tale of Trevor's backstory in the games, and while he continues to be a proud member of the Belmont clan, contrary to the game canon where the Belmonts cooperate with the church and operate in the name of Christianity, Trevor's history in the show with Wallachia and the church has been a traumatizing experience. Being the last of his bloodline due to the corruption of the church and its misguidance of the populace to the purpose of the Belmont family. And with that kind of experience growing up, being ostracized, hunted, and exiled for your lineage, it's really not hard to imagine that a child with such an experience will develop kind of like a pessimistic attitude while drinking his sorrows to sleep every night. The old speaker sees this and confronts Trevor about living a defeated life, and with their refusal to leave the city with inevitable death at their door, this act ignites and rekindles the fire within him to carry on his family's name, to do what must be done for the good of Wallachia. Maneuvering the mob and taking down the crooked priest until Sypha clears the path for him revealing her magical abilities and giving Trevor the opportunity to out the main goon of the bishop and to inform the civilians of the truth resulting in the townsfolk turning on the church, siding with Trevor and Sypha to defend the city from the attacking night creatures. Once the main night creature is disposed of, its implosion tears open the ground and into the catacombs Trevor and Sypha fall into to navigate and come upon the prophesied sleeping soldier, Alucard. As prophesied, the sleeping soldier will be met by a hunter and a scholar. Thus the trio is formed and Trevor has reshaped his purpose in order to honor his family's name. So before we get on with what transpires next, I think we should reflect on Trevor's fighting prowess and undeniable ability as a threat to any opposition in the world of Castlevania. While 90% of the time he may seem unmotivated to do anything physically demanding, the other 10% is dedicated to displaying that Trevor is a genius in battle. Fighting seems almost natural to him, to the point that us the audience would forget that he comes from a lineage of trained vampire killers. His ability to fight any and every type of creature using any form of melee combat, whether purposefully or on the fly, is so high that he comes off like a Gary Stu. From seasons 1, 2, 3, and finally 4, we bear witness to the countless variety of enemies falling at his whim. While his main weapon is the Vampire Killer Whip, he also carries with him a short sword and throwing daggers. But if those won't do the trick, he's more than willing to improvise by using random weapons in his vicinity or simply taking his enemy's weapon and turning it against him. And if that's not deadly enough, why not equip him with the most legendary weapon developed by his family to be the bane of the undead, the Morning Star. A weapon so powerful that even Dracula recognized it and after being put on his knees, decided it's time to get serious. On top of that, get a hold on the Combat Cross, which increases his close quarters and long range capabilities. Trevor seems to be stronger and more durable than the average human warrior. Being able to survive falls from high altitude and taking blows from full-fledged vampires and night creatures without being injured. He was even able to injure Alucard while both were crossing blades. When the use of a weapon is unavailable to him, he will resort to hand-to-hand -to -hand combat with such skill that it's effective against night creatures and even undead with tougher hides like werewolves. 
Given all the accolades of his combat skill and the legendary weapons at his arsenal, the most important piece of equipment that allows him to be such an effective killing machine is not the Morning Star or the Combat Cross. Not even the dagger that conveniently took out death. The most important weapon in his arsenal is his mind. As many martial artists understand, while a weapon may be very powerful, its effectiveness mainly depends on the warrior and how they choose to wield said weapon. As stated earlier, Trevor is a genius and embodies the spirit of a true warrior by using his mind first in any potential altercation. Every instructor I've studied under may not have all said it the same way, but it all surmised the same. The best way to win a fight is to avoid it or come out unscathed. It may sound a bit cowardly, but all who have taken part in deadly combat or war understand that life is precious, and having the ability to take life is not something to play with. Trevor has showcased this mindset since his introduction to the show in Season 1 at the tavern scene. These men are looking for violence, and even though he has the ability to eliminate them, tries to avoid eye contact. When that fails, tries yielding his coin, then tries to avoid conversation then tries to deny his accusation of being a Belmont. And even when being struck, he tries to yield and admits he is a Belmont to ease the tension. But when all else fails, he has to defend himself. He even gives this courtesy to the arrogant priest in Greshit later in the season, twice at that. He has a keen eye for solving puzzles and analyzing his foe which allow him to survive while exploring new areas. A sharp mind to read situations and monsters he is facing from training and recollecting knowledge from his family bestiary. Having such a sharp mind for collecting data on his foe to improvise and set up traps in the middle of combat. On top of all that, he has proven to be an effective leader in delegating a procedure for success against the undead time and time again. An attribute that even Alucard recognized and forced him to acknowledge so that he may naturally step into the role going forward. Come on, Belmont. Time to choose. You're either the last son of a warrior dynasty or a lucky drunk. Which is it? Mm. Okay. Get the mirror working, Alucard. Give me force numbers, species, and weapons count. Cypher stays on her job for now. I'll fortify the point of entry. He automatically did so in Greshit to help the citizens defend the city from night creature attacks. Led the directive when his family keep was being attacked. Delegated roles when attacking Dracula's castle. Took the initiative to cut off Dracula's head when Alucard hesitated to. Realized that Alucard was best equipped to watch over the Belmont Hold and Dracula's castle. Took monster parts to sell and make coin after defeating night creatures. Encouraged the judge to organize an attack on the monks of the Priory in order to stop the incoming demon invasion. Cut the arm of the vampire that paralyzed Sypho while battling his own foe to enable the chain reaction to kill all four vampires before taking on Dragon together. Last, he elected to stay behind and take on death so that everyone else can escape to safety. The only flaw that is associated with Trevor is unlike his iteration in the games, he does not have the ability to use and manipulate magic, but I'm guessing that was on purpose to give Sypho more shine as a resident witch of the crew. All in all, these skills and attributes are all embedded in a person that has been on his own since he was 12 years old. Which in the show I can predict he may be in his mid late 20s or possibly 30. But imagine the potential he would have on top of all we witnessed him accomplish in the show if he grew up into adulthood fully trained in the ways of the family craft. Like a few of our favorites in the show, Trevor after season 1 has indirectly been given the opportunity to rediscover himself, especially after Cypher's grandfather gave him the counseling he needed to self-reflect, and as a result has resolved to take up the family tradition again by taking on the mission to rid the world of Dracula. In that process, he was able to return home after years of traveling Wallachia, reminisce about his childhood and confront the ghosts of his past. As Cypher removes the hearthstone block in the entrance of his family archives, the trio head down into the keep. 
On the path is a picture of Leon Belmont, the first of the family to hunt vampires and monsters. We learn that the Belmont family is originally from France and eventually moved east to establish their base and their family in Wallachia in order to hunt Dracula himself. This is a direct reference to the events of Castlevania Lament of Innocence, where Leon Belmont swore to hunt and kill his friend Matthias Krombix for manipulating him in order to gain immortality and become the Count Dracula himself. He informs his companions on how his family operations work, leading to opening the vault to a large archive of accumulated knowledge. Trevor coincidentally comes upon the family heirloom, and for the first time on the show, we witness him show genuine excitement. And for good reason too, because that heirloom is the Morning Star, which I'm sure could have only been opened by Trevor given the way the treasure box reacted to him opening it. This experience has allowed him to recover from his life of solitude. For as much as Alucard gets on his nerves and Sypha pokes into his business, Underneath all the stoic and standoffish attitude, he is slowly becoming content in their company, allowing the opportunity while facing many trials in the middle of danger to build actual friendship with others and the opportunity to fall in love. As they make their way to the final showdown at Dracula's castle, he faces the painting of his ancestor and clinches the Morning Star, indicating that he goes to battle in the name of the Belmont family to finish what Leon started. He compliments Sypha. I'm pretty good, right? You're the best. Displaying steady change in attitude, but more than likely towards her as his love interest, evident by how they come together after the deed is done. Even as to give Alucard his ancestral home to build something more promising out of the Belmont and Dracula's libraries for the world, as he takes heed that Alucard mentioned about removing Dracula from the world. He's a repository of centuries of learning. He could have changed the world, I think he might have. Recognizing that Alucard has more time to spend on this world thanks to his vampiric genes. You have rediscovered yourself, and you've grown. Today might be the first time I felt like I was talking to an adult man. You're better than you were when I met you. Do you know why I think that is? It's because you're doing what you were born for. As insane as it sounds, this entire nightmare scenario has made you complete. Season 3 is a bit peculiar for Trevor, traveling with Sypha and hunting the remnants of night creatures throughout the countryside for a few months, then coming upon Linenfeld and offering their services to the people and the judge. The peculiar thing is he's just going along with Sypha's vision, but you can tell it's taken a toll on him given how he fiends for a drink of beer. I guess old habits are hard. He even avoids conversation with Saint Germain the following morning to not fall off the wagon, metaphorically speaking. Then due to boredom, both of them become the town's investigators, hired by the judge to investigate their church. But in one moment, when he is out in the woods taking a walk of solace, he stops at the pond to reflect on what he has been up to, and he's not too happy with himself. He hasn't taken much direction of his life during their travels, simply because he's just doing as Sypha wants to please her. Only because this is the companionship he has been missing throughout his adult experience, and it's safe to say he's a bit whipped. As they become familiar with Saint Germain and move further with their investigative work, they learn of the monks plot to open a portal to hell. During the night in bed, they discuss about Saint Germain but Trevor reveals that the man troubles him. And funny how what he describes is the exact person he used to be prior to the events of season one. But you know what really bothers me? What? And maybe he's been on his own for so long. But he was willing to drop the front that quickly because he that desperately needed friends. He's that sad, that alone, suffering under that loss. Hmm. Remind you of someone. A living reflection of himself in Saint Germain's desperation and longing for friends. Once the monks, the night creatures, demons are stopped, they make a shocking discovery due to the judge's last words. The whole town of Linenfell has been consumed and destroyed during the soul harvest. Then lo and behold, the judge was not the benevolent leader he claimed to be, revealing his little pleasures in murdering children of the town the same way he sent the leader of the monks to his death at the end episode. Thus the thrill of adventure has run its course, and as they leave, Trevor states what must be said. You've spent a couple of months living your life. Adventures and victories. Now... We're living my life. And so, for the majority of season four, for six long weeks it is as Trevor exclaimed. 
They are living his life, walking the world, or more specifically the country of Wallachia as professional monster slayers, encountering and battling all sorts of monstrosities day in and day out. Night creatures, skeleton knights, warlocks, ghouls, goblins, rogue vampires, and even human sympathizers that worship death. These instances have taken such a toll on both of them that even Cypher's jolly happy-go-lucky attitude has gone sour. You in turn me into someone who says shit. Fuck that eats shit, hairy arse, dwarfs, giant slimy balls, shit! Somehow, they end up back at the origin of the war of the humankind, at Targavishta, again exhausted and battling rogue vampires of Dracula's empire. But you know, after all these tough trials, at least there are benefits to them as Trevor conveniently finds beneficial upgrades to his arsenal, starting off with this magical dagger. And so, here is where Varney reveals himself as the orchestrator of the increase in undead, human misery, and the resurrection of Dracula. As they rummage through what remains of the once great city of Targa Bishta, they come upon Xanfir after being aided in the barn by her and her guards of the uh, underground court. As the duo continue to read the situation of the city and Xanfir's state, and since they're living his life now, we can see how Trevor retakes his ownership by sitting Cypher down so they can calculate and move forward with a sound plan and clear minds devoid of exhaustion. Thus the Belmont is back, brainstorming, cautiously plotting the next plan of attack, monster hunting professional business, and conveniently continues to find more upgrades. A magical stone here, a combat cross there, an empty gourd to fill with holy water, another piece to add to the dagger. As Varney and Rocco attack the underground court, Trevor battles Rocco while severely exhausted and losing it, but ends up defeating him with the help of Xanthir sacrificing herself. Then following Varney through this transfer mirror back to Dracula's castle and reuniting with Alucard. But we all know what happens after this. Saifa uses Kiraga and the crew, they fight and kill the mini bosses, the dungeon boss and his adds. But then it's like a culmination of conveniences come into play. He uses the combat cross in combination with the holy water he collected from the catacombs to defeat the Rebus. But before miraculously defeating death with the dagger with its enhancements, he confesses his love to Saifa and indirectly tells her not to name their child Trefor. In the wake of his heroic sacrifice, before Saifa abandons all hope and Alucard regrets losing another friend, Fate intervenes and it's revealed that he survived due to being thrown into the infinite corridor. How freaking lucky is this guy? But then again, it's as if fate kept on pulling him back. Back to his home where he lost everyone dear to him only to regain a new family and build a lasting community from the ashes together on the same grounds. Trevor Belmont, the last son of the family of famed hunters of the night and yet another instrument of fate destined to be molded and shaped by the cruel realities of the world. The more he struggled against the path, the more fate pulled him in the direction of his destiny. Although once thought to be the last of a dying breed, while buried in the ashes of his predecessors, he channeled his inner warrior and pride, rising like a phoenix in the internal fire, personifying the words of the legendary Bruce Lee, absorbing what is useful by using all the accumulated training and knowledge passed down to him from generations prior discarding what is useless and letting go of his spite to stop running away from the past and face forward in his family name. Lastly, adding what is specifically his own by making invaluable friendships in Saifa and Alucard to enact justice, falling in love, and lighting a new path for the Belmont legacy. Thank you for taking your time to watch this character analysis. Unlike the previous breakdowns I made for the show, I did not expect this to be so interesting. In a way, I kind of expected this one to be a bit shorter than most of the other prominent characters in the show because I didn't really expect so many nuances to Trevor. Yet interestingly, this one became just as long and if not longer than Isaac's breakdown. Pause. But all in all, let me know what you all think in the comments section about Trevor, and most importantly about my analysis of him. I really enjoyed reading all of your insight and feedback and stay tuned for more character breakdowns which are in the works. As you all know, these video essays take a lot of time and energy to make, so I'm really thankful to those who decide to watch my content in full, but to show more appreciation, please drop a like. If you were overjoyed and feel generous in appreciation of my work, give me a super thanks. 
It's similar to the like button, but it goes further by donating any amount of your choice to show appreciation for what I do on YouTube. If you are new to the channel and also like the content provided, subscribe and check out the videos and the channel at your leisure. As always, you know the vibes. It's Kazaku Slevin. Appreciate you.